everything we do really has to have that kind of lack of self-orientation. At the heart, we want to provide value to others in everything we do, be it sales, be it delivery, be it relationships or anything else that we can help the client with you know, going above and beyond to make them successful and elevate their careers, the individuals as well as the organizations that they work in. You know, that is lack of self-orientation in a nutshell. My name's Mike Lander, and you're listening to Higgle, the B2B Sales Club podcast, where we bring you actionable insights about sales RFPs, negotiations, and difficult procurement discussions from sales leaders, brand leaders, and procurement leaders. Please subscribe to get updates when new episodes are released. Kane, thanks ever so much for joining me on Higgle, the B2B Sales Club podcast. No worries. Thank you for the invite. Mike, good to be here. Yeah, and how long, I don't know, how long have we known each other now? A long time. <laughs> it is a long time, isn't it? Yeah. It's a long time. Yeah, probably seven or eight years, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. I'd have thought so. And you, we, I've got to know you much better over the last couple of years as well. And that's part of what we'll talk about on the podcast, about long-term relationship building. Yeah. Because you like people rather than you've got some other motive going on. So, um, but we will talk about that in a second. So, first of all, Kane, for people listening... Who are you? Kind of, what do you do? What's your background? And anything unusual about yourself? <laughs> it's probably a lot. Probably a, a lot that's unusual about myself. Um, <laughs> so my yeah. So my background is a you know I'm a career consultant. I founded a digital consultancy called Red Badger in 2010 with two others. Um, was CEO there for 10 and a half years. I'm still heavily involved, but uh, took a bit of a step back from the operational side of the business three years ago. Um, and still now I'm involved on the board, like helping with strategy and commercial. Um, and Red Badger, for those that are listening, are it's a digital product transformation consultancy. So we help very large companies, you know, the likes of HSBC, Lloyd's, Barclays, Santander, JP Morgan in banking, big retailers, Tesco, ASOS, and um, media companies mostly. So BBC, Financial Times, News UK, uh, you know, Reach, PLC, etc. Uh, so we help them with strategy, execution, and then capability build for, you know, end-to-end digital product transformation and I've been doing that for 14 years now. Wow, amazing. Uh, and then what's uh, unusual about myself? So um, what to choose? Uh, <laughs> I met my wife at Burning Man. I think that's quite unusual. Um, amazing. Sort of 12 years ago and we lived a mile up the road, had been to similar social events but never met met at those social events and ended up yeah. to travel out to the Nevada desert to meet her. Um, well, the rest is history. <laughs> I've never been to Burning Man. It looks amazing and fascinating, but I'm sure it's uh, very different on the inside than it looks on the outside. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. A, a real hub of creativity. Yeah, amazing. Sure. So, uh, we're not here to talk about Burning Man, but it's a fascinating story. <laughs> um, so, we thought we'd talk about a few questions around kind of business development as a broad topic. Yeah. So, uh, let's kick off with the first one, which is, um, why do you view relationship building as a very long-term, multi-year kind of strategic pursuit? Um, and it's not centered around you winning more work. Uh, in fact, it, it's really kind of the opposite. So, so why... Why have you taken that view and just expand on it a bit further? Um, yeah, so relationships are built on trust, first and foremost. And trust is not something that is transactional. It's not something that you can build overnight, you know, of one and through one or two yeah. meetings. Um, and really, the way that I do commercial, the way that I win work is almost the antithesis of transactional sales. You know, I, I like people. I invest in personal relationships with people. Um, and, you know, I try and provide value to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, that whole trust equation 
yeah. uh, that is uh, really famous. So, you know, credibility plus reliability plus intimacy divided by lack of self-orientation. You know, yep. so all of those things together are kind of how I like to engage with people. Um, and that takes a long time. It's not something yeah. that sort of happens overnight. So when I meet people, I don't really talk, certainly not at the beginning, about um, you know what opportunities they can give me and how you know do they have a need and how can they help me grow Red Badger. It's more about investing in them as a person. Um, yeah. And if we don't get on, regardless of whether there's opportunity there or not. Um, I don't pursue that relationship. You know, it has to be based on um, a relationship. Okay, I found this on the web for pursue that relationship. Sorry, that's uh, Siri there. Sorry about that. Uh, (laughs) That's all right. um, Yeah, and so I like people. I invest long-term in people, and uh, that's the whole intimacy piece. And then I, you know, try and help them and they help me and over time that might turn into something it might not but you know you get a friend you gain friends through that approach so it's you a do. win-win for me really yeah and you find I mean uh, uh, and we've talked about this before uh, a lot over the years um, you just find things in common that you wouldn't find out through talking about business so uh, you know I, I found out you have a, a, a passion for uh, vinyl and for audio uh, and all things audio, and I, it's one of my passions. And then you start to talk about that a lot more, and about what that means, and why you do it, and the kind of music you're into, and why high end audio is so important, and all sorts of things like that. And that it makes it a much richer relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And I spend probably ninety percent of my time cycling around town, meeting people where I have that kind of rich relationship with like yeah. rich deep conversations about their personal lives and then we help each other out you know it's uh exactly it's uh, i'll introduce people to other people that might be able to help them you know we help yeah i've helped clients get new jobs and then they become a client in the new place you know it's just a you know a, a proper value exchange but really the foundation is uh one based on friendship and trust and so, you yeah. know, if you can build friendship and trust at some point, that might turn into an opportunity and it might not, but, you know. Exactly. And they'll, uh, as we talked about before, they will, in conversations with their friends, they will talk to their friends about you and about what you do and, and about who you are as a human being. Uh, and that can lead to all sorts of just interesting opportunities, be it business or non-business. Exactly. And we're we're all human after all, and so uh, exactly a human Correct. is you know at the heart of everything that we do. You know whether it's selling or you've won a project and you're delivering. The success of success, you know, a delivery is completely dependent on human connection as well, and everyone getting on and trust. Yeah. So you know, sales is and. And forming new relationships is at the very beginning of, uh, you know, a, a project's life cycle. And so you need to start it uh, where you, you know, where you mean to go on. You know, it has to be based on trust and integrity, you know, credibility, reliability, friendship, human connection, all of that sort of stuff. Because without that, you know, you're not, you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to be able to deliver a, uh, exactly project appropriately once you land it so so let's come back to the kind of like delivering excellence in a minute um but just uh let's just delve into a little bit more about this um lack of self orientation when building trusted advisor relationships so for those uh, people listening that are thinking what are they talking about with this trust equation mm. um there was a a famous book uh as we we both know by a guy called David Meister uh many many years ago called the trusted advisor yeah Anyone listening that's in high-end sales, selling at C-suite, um, if you've not read it already, I would strongly recommend you do. And it was a great piece of work, wasn't it? And it was about how do you build trusted relationships. Um, and the, the bottom part of the equation, uh, the denominator, was around lack of self-orientation. Do you want to just like dig into that a bit more, Kane, and, and give your view of what that means and why it's important? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> it's it's the biggest factor in the trust equation because it's you know right. you've got the three things on the top of the line, uh, so credibility, reliability, and intimacy, and then all of those things, three things added together, divided by self or lack of self orientation equals trust. Yeah. So the single biggest factor in the equation is lack of self orientation. Um, and effectively, that is um, behavior that is not focused on oneself in the process of, yeah. of a sale. Um, and so, you know, you really have the best interests at heart of the person that you're dealing with, the person that you're selling to, um, you know, and you're trying to provide value or a service to them. Um <clears throat> And I, f- I find that people that are the best salespeople don't necessarily need the book because they do this naturally. Mm. You know, if right. they, they like people, they are like helping others. Um, they provide naturally provide a value, uh, p- provide value and a service to others and just want to help. Um, and they tend to be the best salespeople, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so naturally, they kind of build trusted advisor relationships. But the book is brilliant at kind of unpicking all of those behaviors uh, that that kind of make the best trusted advisors. And so, yeah, it's really about making sure that everything that you do is of service to others. You know, so yeah. we, <clears throat> we well, myself, but also Red Badger, feel that, you know, we... We'll only engage with a client if we feel we can provide value. If we don't think the right um, structures or behaviors are in place, or at least the ability to get people into that right place, if that doesn't exist and we, we don't feel we can provide value, we won't take the revenue because yeah. it's, um, you know, it doesn't ever result in a good trusted advisor relationship um and those types of projects don't end up uh, where you want them to be so exactly so everything we do really has to have that kind of lack of self orientation at the heart we want to provide value to others in everything we do be it sales be it delivery be it sort of you know relationships or uh, anything else that we can help the the kind of client with you know, going above and beyond to make them successful and elevate their careers, the individuals as well as the organisations that they work in. Um, you know, that is lack of self-orientation in a nutshell. Very good. Um, some reflections on kind of when I was taught to sell. Uh, so I was taught to sell at KPMG, really, mm-hmm. uh, back in the day. Um, and we were taught, obviously, consultative selling because we were a big consultancy. Um, And it was really interesting. One of the things when we looked at that kind of trusted advisor model, um, we could start to spot people who, as you say, had natural uh, instincts that lent itself to um, relationship-based trusted advisor selling. And uh, we used to like play little scenarios. And the scenario that one of the partners said to me was like, Mike, okay, so you're you're meeting a a C-suite exec. Um, It's in a big company. Uh, It's your first meeting. Um, So how are you going to start to build that trusted advisor relationship? Well, of course, the instinct goes, well, I'll start to ask them about them and I'll start to focus more on them than on me and I'll, I'll start to ask them about their issues and about their business. And I remember this guy saying to me, he said, you could do that. But he said, the problem with doing that with someone you don't know is that why would they open up to you? If you don't know this person, how on earth would they be trusting enough to open up with their deepest, darkest issues? in their business. And he said, what you might want to do is start with the credibility piece. Gently start with who you are and the kind of work that you are involved in and some insights about their industry and some of the people that you've met like them and the kind of issues that they have. And then move into the, so uh, how does that feel for you? How Are any of those issues relevant to you? Have you seen anything similar? You know, which of these are your top three? And it, it, it always stuck with me that it's like, you can't start by building a relationship with someone at that level 
instantly and get them to trust you. You certainly can't do it in a group meeting. You have to do it. It's one-on-one. It's like, and I guess it goes back to good old-fashioned building personal relationships. If I met you in a bar, then I wouldn't start asking you about your deepest, darkest, kind of like human, kind of like uh, issues. Because you told me to go and F off, probably, I expect. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> you start something different. You start a bit more uh, gentler about who you are as a person, some credibility. Does that kind of resonate with your new, with new relationships that you're building? How do you start to build that trusted relationship with a lack of self-orientation? Yeah, so um, I agree with you. It's, a, it's analogous to cold calling someone and asking them if they would have a coffee with you. Right. They're not, right. They're not going to because <laughs> they're very busy. Exactly. Why 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 would they have a coffee with you? Who are you? But exactly but if you educate them and you yes. you uh, give them something that they didn't know before, something that they can learn that is a compelling reason to have a conversation with you, where exactly. you know they they are intrigued, you know, that, that's yeah. the credibility bit. And so, you know, that's what you know, the large organizations like KPMG are, are, that you mentioned are historically fantastic at because they will they are. They'll have sea level sea uh, level relationships, but they will take a solution to those sea level people in a client um, to a problem that that client didn't know they had until they had that conversation. You know, so they yeah. they are kind of looking ahead going into the sea level and saying this thing's coming up, be it regulation or, you know, something happening in the, something happening in the market, consumer behavior. You need to be able to yep. think about this because this is how it's going to impact your business. And by the way, this is the solution to that problem. Yeah. Um, that's a great sell because all of a sudden you're in a conversation where uh, that client is intrigued and they need to know yeah. more. You know, so that's where, you know, thought leadership comes from, you know, it, sales is not about persuasion. So you don't ever want to be in a position where you're trying, exactly. trying to persuade a client to use you. You want to yep. let them know what you have to offer. Uh, and that is credibility. It's reliability. You can talk about the things you do. You can run events. You can give information away for free. You can do free workshops. Um, and all of these things are kind of, um, you know, our, fr- our mutual friend, John Godfrey, who's the commercial director yep. at Red Badger, it's how we met. Absolutely. He calls them gold coins. So it's like little, right. little, yeah, yeah, little yeah. nuggets of, you know, treasure that you just lay down, take a step back, and then you lay down another one. And then the client's kind of intrigued to, yep. cut, to like come towards you and pick up the gold coins to learn more. Um, yep. And really, that's kind of the credibility bit. Really, you, you know, you're not trying, you're not trying to persuade the client to to use your services. You're informing them about what you can do, and then at some point in the future, where there, where there's a need, yeah, uh, they might uh, give you a call. But you know, that credibility bit, as you said in the question, is kind of how you might open up doors to a new conversation um and then exactly. that gives you the kind of ability once the door is open to start building the trust like through self, lack of self orientation offering ha- you know help you know get Absolutely. to a bit of a deeper discussion about personal relationships the intimacy bit um, yeah so yeah that's i agree it's not you know you can't you can't start with intimacy. You know, you need to really no. <laughs> start, you need to start with credibility. But underlying exactly. it is the set lack of self orientation all the way through. Yeah, definitely. And I was um, someone summarised it to me years ago as being: you've got to, you have to earn the right to build trust, and you earn the right by starting a relationship. You build on credibility. And then you're naturally drawn towards each other and you start to discuss deeper and deeper issues. I mean, I'm sure you've had it, Kane, a lot, a lot given who you are. People call you uh, years later. I mean, I've had like people literally, I see them every like three to six months. And then 
five years down the line, something happens that I never expected because I, I, I wasn't looking for it. Yeah. But something great happens and that's brilliant. But you have to invest in the long term for the right uh, purpose-led reasons. Exactly. And this is why I don't like things like... So you get a lot of agencies like Red Badger where they they will use an SDR, like an, an external yes. agency. We'll give them our value propositions. We'll build a list, phone them up and see if you can get me meetings. Yeah. You know, and it's you know throwing mud at a wall and seeing what sticks. But there's no no element of trust in that approach at all. You know, you can no. use an SDR to remind someone to come to an event, but the trust has to already be in place by that point. You know, the relation right. it's all about relationships. So I, you know, I want to invite people uh into my circle or to an event that I'm running or to a, you know, some sort of um compelling reason to have a one to one meeting based on the relationship with me. Yeah. With people that I like. It's not yeah. something that I would like to outsource. No. You know, so that's, how I <laughs> <laughs> that's not how I operate. That's a very, very good point. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And a lot of agencies are because markets are tough at the moment. A lot of agencies are trying the I'm going to outsource uh, lead gen. Yeah. And I'm like, I've asked quite a lot of agencies, is it working? And they're like, eh, not really. No. <laughs> no, it's very, very <laughs> Works hard. for certain, yeah, certain types of businesses, which are very product oriented. Um, I think it, it is working for some of them, where it's a very, very specific product solving a very particular problem. And they're relatively lower value. But for higher value sales, it doesn't work at all. No. No. And, you know, in the past, in my the less experienced Kane Aller has definitely tried it. Um and it and it it has never worked for us. Yeah. So um you know, I don't want to sort of uh, say they're all rubbish no. or anything like that, but it is just about um Kind of that whole, if you want to do trusted advisor selling, it's got to be based on a personal relationship that you build yourself. Yeah, and it's uh, you have to invest for the long term. Because yes. where you are now, your network is, I'd imagine, exceptionally strong. So it becomes the flywheel is kind of self-fulfilling at that point. Yeah, yeah, no, and we win, you know, we've got people, you know, I've got people in my network that have been my client four or five times in four or five different roles. We've elevated them, their career, yeah. they've elevated us. And, yeah. you know, we all work very well together. And they just, every time they move companies, they take us with them. You know, and that, exactly. That is um, the ch- sure sign that, uh, you know, you've uh, provided value to them. So this will sound, uh, it, it sounds so obvious on paper. And I talked about this with a, a CEO friend of mine literally yesterday. <laughs> Um, about delivering excellence. Why is delivering excellence so important when you're building trusted advisor relationships at the C-suite? Well, it's uh, <clears throat> it's all about value. You know, you can't... You... I mean, it sounds obvious, doesn't it? It's like asking the question, I'm like, well, if you don't deliver excellence, that's going to be clearly a problem, but... <laughs> yeah, and you, you can't um, sell based on trust with credibility and reliability being part of the equation and then fail to deliver because that's exactly credibility and reliability <laughs> out the window and disintegrate exactly right away so you get i've i've met a number of companies i'm not going to name them obviously that are excellent sales people you know they yep. but they're quite aggressive in the sale they win work and don't deliver, you know, and you look at the the kind of longevity of their client relationships and they're kind of not longer than six months, you know. Yeah, <laughs> And they're exactly. permanently in the sales cycle just trying to fill the gaps of business opportunities that are ending because they're not delivering. Uh, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> that's 
a way of doing it and you can build a successful business on on that. But I feel like it has a shelf life because everything is yeah. reputation. And eventually if you get build a reputation for not delivering and not really caring that you're not delivering, which is often the case, yeah. um, you know, that people will eventually start to to not use you and your reputation will, you know, kind of uh, get around, so to speak. Um, so, you know, for us, and certainly for me, as, a, as you know, I don't do delivery. I never have, not at Red Badger. You know, I've been CEO, always been quite commercial, you know, holding the senior relationships. But that is so hard to build, you know, to sell and build trusted advisor relationship if the rest of your team that are in charge of delivery are not very yep. good or not doing a good job. Exactly. Um, whereas at Red Badger, it makes my life so much easier that I can talk about actual success stories. You know, being yep. at HSBC for four years and moving the time it takes to open a bank account from thirty days to five minutes. You know, and and those types wow. of those types of stories we have loads of them and without yeah without that credibility around our ability to deliver my job would be a million times harder exactly right um but also um you know you continue to sort of provide value and a client continues to buy from from you so you have long term yeah. relationships which means that gives you a foundation of stability financially as a company upon which to grow you know, you're not always trying to replace lost deals uh, yep. lost, lost clients and you haven't got the same utilization issues obviously utilization in my world as a digital consultancy is everything pretty much um, unless you've yep. got different rep sources of revenue but for T&M work time and materials utilization is number one Really, you know, you need to end obviously day rates and things like that. Um, so, you know, you don't want teams coming off of client accounts and then f having to resource them again. And it's, exactly, it's, it's really hard to manage. And that, so, do a good job. The client continues to buy from from you. You don't have to worry about. Yep. teams suddenly uh, being on the bench, you know, and you've got to then find new opportunities to to, to resource them onto. So, um, yeah, so at the heart of everything really is, you know, quality, excellence in everything you do, being really driven to provide value to the client, um, make them look good, but move the needle on all of the metrics that, you know, that you're accountable for. And, uh, you know, that is very, very um, kind of uh, good for the trust equation and it makes my life a lot easier when I'm then trying to open up new doors with credibility, a bit, you know, as we discussed previously, credibility being the door opener. You know, if yep. you don't have that credibility, then uh, you know, it makes it a lot harder. So a friend and colleague of mine who I work with, a um, guy called Kevin Gibbons, very talented guy, um, runs an SEO agency. <clears throat> and we, about, two, I don't know, three, four years ago, we were in a room with a whiteboard and some pens and thinking, and um, it, there were some, some tough times. And we came up with a, a really simple mantra, having spent a lot of time thinking it through, which was excellence, retention, and growth in that order. Mm. So we'll start with delivering excellence. That will allow us to retain clients which solves the utilization problem and they'll refer us to other people because we do such great work and they'll be referenceable. It's taken us three or four years to make it work. Yeah. But it works. Then it works sustainably. But you've got to invest in it for the long run. Exactly. I know Kevin very well. He's a, he's a great yeah. guy. Um, he's a lovely guy, isn't he? Yeah. He's just a very, really genuine, decent, hum humble human being yeah he's a he's a trusted advisor for sure he is um but yeah it's uh it's you know revenue becomes a byproduct of quality you know yeah. focus on quality and then the revenue will look after itself to a degree it's not fully um but it will yeah. certainly make it a lot easier to to generate exactly right
So, last question, because um, we're about to run out of time broadly. Um, just talk about, about, you've talked about value creation quite a lot. Um, when you talk to clients and you're at the early stages and um, you're developing the relationships and you're talking about some of their biggest challenges, um, particularly in the banking, about you know, time to open an account, for example, how do you start to build that kind of, um, what I would call a kind of yeah, a value equation, uh, a value map? How do you start to map out the value with a client so that it's not just we're going to deliver some digital products, but we can link that directly to value creation? Because in a lot of agencies find that really hard, to be honest, about quantifying the value we're going to create based upon the fee we're going to charge looks like this. Mm -hmm. you know, some of it is um, financial, some of it is non-financial. Have you got like a framework for doing that or is that just part an inherent part of how you talk to clients and how you sell your work? Um, so we have many different types of engagement and it d d depends on the client, <clears throat> depends on what they want, first of all, but also depends on the complexity of, a, of the business. You know, so um, if you're talking about a company the size of HSBC that has you know, close to 40,000 yeah. people in the IT department, uh, owning wow. owning <laughs> metrics is hard, like without yes. very, very complex dependency management. Um, having said that, we the perfect project for us is one where we can be fully accountable for an outcome. Right. Um, and that outcome will generally have some metrics that are defined around, you know, what does success look like? And so we'll work in the early stages of a client engagement in the discovery phase or pre-discovery and, you know, even in the, for free sometimes in the sales cycle. Um, we'll, we'll start helping them work out what those metrics should be. Um, yeah. So, you know, we do North Star workshops, for example, where, you know, for example, you know, you might have a metric around loyalty that is reward redemptions, but you have to then look at kind of breadth, depth, frequency, efficiency, all of the all of the things that kind of kind of cascade up to that north star. Uh, yep. And then all of, and then you can work out what the kind of features or um, kind of activities that are required to move the needle on all of those different types of metrics that ultimately will result in the, you know, so exactly. So HSBC, for example, we were um, accountable for the speed to open a bank account. Um, conversion, so re re conversion was very low there. And so improved right. conversion rate for account opening specifically. Uh, so this is someone that would start to open an account, but then abandon. Yes, exactly. Right. Um, and then there were technical metrics as well. So they were only able to deliver um, three production releases per year. Right. And so it's kind of how do you actually increase the frequency of value delivered to customer? And yep. and so you know we we got them to a point at you know, after a couple of years where it was continuous deployment into production. So as soon as a line of code was written, it was in the hands of a customer. So it was multiple times a day. Um, wow. And so, you know, we will try and work with the client to understand what those metrics should be. And then that can kind of really focus everyone around moving the needle on those metrics. Um, and ideally, we like to own the outcome in you know, so we can do value-based pricing and things like that. So yes. You'll have an element of T&M, but then you'll also have shared risk, shared upside. Um, in an organization like HSBC, for a, for a company like Red Badger, that was impossible to do that. Yeah. Just because of the size, the nature of complex dependencies, lawyers involved or other teams involved, you, could, you couldn't fully own the outcome. Um Whereas the smaller organizations, you really can. And then you can exactly you can kind of put your um money where your mouth is by taking some risk and saying we are very confident in our ability to deliver and we will reduce our rates, but also if we do deliver, we want a percentage of you know the, the upside. Um 
And we have a very strong confidence in our ability to actually make more money out of those yeah. types of engagements because we always deliver. But also exactly. it's kind of easier for the client to buy because of the shared risk piece, yeah. which is, you know, builds trust immediately. And yeah, how do we know how do we know that we're building trust? Well we know because our, our interests are aligned. Exactly. If we have misaligned interests, very hard to trust each other. Yeah. Because we're pulling in different directions. Yeah. So alignment, shared goals. Yeah, we do we do quite a lot of work up front on all of that type of stuff, as well as yeah. the kind of quant, you know, the metrics that need to be moved. And we have all of that packaged right at the very beginning before we, you know, and it might evolve, but generally we all, we're all kind of yeah. know, singing from the same hymn sheet and, and ready to go. Um, and then it's, you know, we have very, very robust reporting through ev- throughout every stage of the delivery, you know, and obviously at the beginning it's a bit woollier uh, because, yep. you know, lots of unknowns are being tackled and some of the big complex pieces are being unpicked. Um, but once you get into a real cadence, you can be really accurate with uh, kind of the, exactly with the forecast and those sorts of things. So, you know, transparency, good communication, um, and you know, shared goals, also shared problems. You know, so yep. often there'll be some dependency that is out of our control that's blocking us and. Some organizations across their arms and say, well, this isn't our problem. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're exactly. on the clock, we're still billing you, but you, you can yeah. solve that. Whereas the badges will uh, are very much of the mindset that let's roll our sleeves up and let's sort out any blockers, you know, regardless yeah. of whether it's in our domain or not. We'll go and speak to lawyers or we're going to, you know, we'll do whatever it takes to exactly speed right. up the delivery. Um, so yeah, that's that's that whole shared shared goals, you know, all singing from the same hymn sheet, but then also having the metrics that you're all kind of aligned yeah. on around what 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 needs 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 to be moved um, is all very very important when it comes to quality of delivery. And I think if I look at non-digital agencies, i.e. they're not building digital products, um, they're delivering more traditional type marketing services, that would be a good lesson to learn, actually, is that I'm often saying to people, look, if you do up front some kind of discovery workshop, value mapping exercise with the client, and even when you're pitching, if you show them what a value mapping workshop looks like and why it's so important and how goal alignment's so important, because we know that whatever's written in a client brief is never actually what the problem is. It's merely a, an interpretation of the problem. Um, more of that uh, being done would create more trusting relationships with clients uh, and agencies, one would argue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for sure, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Kane, yeah. I've taken up plenty of your time. I really, really appreciate having a discussion with you. I, really, I always have a, enjoy having a discussion with you about all sorts of topics. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for joining me. Um, where can people find out more about you? Uh, so you can look at my LinkedIn or Red Badger's website, so red-badger.com, um, or you can email me at kane.aller at red-badger.com. Perfect. Kane, thanks ever so much. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, uh, likewise. Next time, let's do a podcast on vinyl, shall we? You can... Uh, Definitely. Speak. That would be <laughs> outstanding. Vinyl and associated audio equipment. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> top, top five records and the equipment that you like to listen to it on. Oh, top five records and the equipment. Oh, that could go on for a while. That's an excellent <laughs> idea, Kane. Definitely. Let's, let's try that. <laughs> I might do a special episode, which is on this series nothing to do with sales, everything to do with vinyl and audio. I'll take you up on that. Yeah. That's a brilliant idea. Brilliant. Perfect. We'll organize that. Thanks, Ken. It's been a real pleasure. You take care. Cheers on you, mate. Thanks for listening to Higgle, the B2B sales club podcast series with your host, Mike Lander. Please subscribe so that you'll catch all the next episodes.